we designed the Pegasus study, we wanted to accomplish three things. Uh, and it was a bold study, uh, you know, especially now with the benefit of hindsight. We were younger, we were, you know, we wanted to uh, do a lot of things. Uh, and we got very fortunate with the readout. But we, we, we did a lot of things in a small, um, or, or, or only in one study. The first one was to show that uh, systemic pexitacoltan, our drug, when administered twice per week under the skin subcutaneously, which you can do at home, that it could treat PNH. So that was number one as an objective. The second objective was to show that it would be superior to solibis on hemoglobin levels. So to find out that indeed, you know, uh, we could improve the quality of life of these patients by increasing the hemoglobin levels. And the third objective, and this was this is really one that is near and dear to my heart, is we we actually did a mock-up of what it would be like for a patient with PNH to see their hematologist. And for the hematologist to tell that patient, well, you know, uh, listen, Peter, there's a new drug on the market. This is a drug that we believe will make you feel much better, less fatigued, uh, you know, correct your abnormal blood uh, results, etc. What would what is that going to evoke in you as a patient and in the physician to recommend it? Uh, and the the first thing that stood out was fear. You know, if you if you get a proposition like that, if you are taking a life saving drug in the form of solibis or ultramiris, you're going to be afraid to try something else, even if you believe that that will make you feel better. So what we decided to do in the phase three clinical trial was to say, hey, we are not going to take away a very expensive and a life saving drug from patients for something experimental where you don't know, you know, whether it's going to work or how well it is going to work. So instead. We're going to allow these patients for one month to take pexetacoltan, our drug, on top of Soliris in combination. And then after one month, we're not just going to determine whether you can discontinue Soliris and continue with our drug pexetacoltan on monotherapy. We are also going to determine whether patients can at that point in time decide, hey, you know what? Not for me. I'm not feeling better. It didn't make a difference. I want to go at least back to where I was before. And so our control arm were patients that for one month received our drug, even though they were in the control arm, on top of Soliris, where we expected and saw the hemoglobin levels increase uh, as, you, you know, as you did in the active arm. But then after one month, unfortunately in this trial, because it was, it was terrible for patients in, in, in that sense, we had to take the drug away again. And then these patients over the course of approximately one month would go back to where they were before coming into the study. And what we did then is after the four months of the randomized period where we compared the two drugs to each other, at that point in time, the 39 subjects that went in the control arm were allowed to go on dosing with Pexetacoplan in the extension phase and beyond. Um, so for a four month period, there were 39 subjects who for one month got to experience the benefit, but then had, you know, had to live without it again for another four months. And one of the things that gives me, you know, uh, a lot of confidence that we that we can do something important for these patients is that all 39 of these subjects, after you know, after knowing that they were in the control arm, decided to stay in the study, so that they could get, go back on pexetacoplan after the four months of the randomization. So the primary endpoint, as I mentioned, was uh, hemoglobin superiority, and we showed 3.8 grams per deciliter superiority. Over for pexitacoplan over solivis. Now, to put that a little bit in context, if you are a patient with a hemoglobin level of, for example, eight, which was you know more or less the average that we had in this study, an improvement by 3.8 grams per deciliter is a 50% or so improvement. Uh, you know, meaning you have half more red blood cells in circulation. That's a way of thinking about it, right? And think about what what that can do for you as an individual in combination with the fact that your bone marrow is now being left you know, in a more peaceful state and, you know, and, and that was reflected in the fatigue scores, et cetera. So it is important to contextualize that 3.8 grams per deciliter superiority because through the design that we had, the contribution of transfusions to the hemoglobin levels were factored out. And what do I mean by that? If, if you have a patient with a hemoglobin level of 10, for example, but that patient needs to get a transfusion every two to four weeks, right? 
well, then that, that, va that value of 10 is an, is an artifact created by the artificial red blood cells that, that are brought into your body, right? So what we did is we said, look, if any patient during the study requires a transfusion, then we take the hemoglobin level before the transfusion as the value assigned to that patient. So, you know, patients on Soliris were much more likely to be transfusion dependent. So the, the value of hemoglobin that would trigger the transfusion in that group would be the one that was used towards the yeah, endpoint readout, meaning uh, there's a 3.8 grams per deciliter superiority filtered for the contributions, the artificial contributions of red blood cells, which in this case was primarily to the control arm, of course. So that was the primary endpoint. Then the secondary endpoints were transfusion, depend, transfusion avoidance, where we um, you know, saw 85% of patients um, in the uh, Soliris arm who had to go back to receiving transfusions compared to only 15% of patients who were in the arm with Bexitacopan. We then also looked at other secondary endpoints, such as LDH, uh, such as reticulocytosis, how many you know, red blood cells these patients make, again, to kind of reflect on how hard their bone marrow needs to work. And then what we call the facet fatigue score, uh, which is a, a marker of fatigue in these patients. Um, now, the way in which the statistical analysis was run uh, meant that on transfusion avoidance, we showed non-inferiority between the two. But um, after that, for the LDH values, right, the comparison between the two groups could not be done because the sample size was just not sufficient to, the, there was not sufficient data to make that comparison. On an absolute numerical basis, the control of LDH was better on Pexetacopan than it was on Soliris. And remember LDH, you may remember that, is the enzyme that gets released from the explosion. So something that is supposed to be well controlled with a C5 inhibitor. So all of the other analyses in the study were what we call post hoc, where we saw, you know, in the combined picture, um, uh, you know, a, a really clinically meaningful improvement in these patients. Thank you.